This is a timeline of when different human vaccines were first used and documented. You'll find the new mRNA vaccines on the right and Edward Jenner's famous smallpox vaccine on the left. When I first saw this timeline, the thing that caught my attention was this gap here. There are 89 years between the smallpox vaccine and the next one, the vaccine for rabies. And then within a few years, we had vaccines for the plague, influenza, diphtheria, tuberculosis, some of the biggest diseases in human history. So I wondered, why was rabies second? What was it about the disease that made scientists think they could vaccinate against it? And what kind of influence did that vaccine's development have on that cluster of vaccines in the early 20th century? Rabies follows a pretty clear disease progression, which is going to be important later in the story. The first stage is incubation, which is the period between the bite and when symptoms start, which can range anywhere from days to a year, but usually starts one to three months after exposure. Rabies is caused by a bullet-shaped virus called a lysivirus, which is introduced to a new host through the saliva of a rabid animal. Once it's in the body, the virus starts replicating in the muscle cells around the bite, which lets them hide from the host's immune system. After a while, the virus gets into the nervous system through special receptors on the ends of neurons called acetylcholine receptors. And we have a lot of these, not just in our muscles. Acetylcholine is the chemical messenger that lets our nervous system communicate with our muscular system. From there, it creeps through the nerves at anywhere from 8 to 20 centimeters a day until it eventually gets to your central nervous system, the spinal cord and brain. And that leads to the prodrome, where the victim has some generic symptoms like muscle pain and a fever. Then the third stage is when the more specific neurological symptoms happen. At this point, the rabies virus has made it to the central nervous system and will kill its host, but in order to replicate in another host, it needs a way to get there. So it travels from the brain, down the nerves of the face and throat, and starts replicating in the salivary glands. This is where it produces two of the classic symptoms of rabies, hydrophobia and excessive salivation. And by hydrophobia, we're not talking about a fear of water, but an inability to drink. The rabies virus in your throat muscles causes a painful spasm whenever you try to swallow. This is where we get the image of a rabid dog foaming at the mouth. Rabies gets its host to drool so it can spread to other hosts through saliva, and it keeps you from drinking water, which makes sure you don't swallow the viruses in your saliva. It's a really cool strategy from the virus's perspective, but it doesn't happen in every case of rabies. About 85% of cases take the form of furious rabies, which is where we see hydrophobia, but there's also paralytic rabies, which looks more like generalized weakness without hydrophobia. Then there's also a super rare, non-classic form of rabies, which is more associated with seizures. After about a week to 10 days of the acute neurological symptoms, you enter stage four, which is coma. And within two to three days, the victim enters the fifth and final stage, which is death. Ultimately, rabies kills you by causing a swelling of the brain and then cardiac arrest. If untreated, mortality is 100%. If it is treated, though, mortality is lower, but that took us a while to figure out. Rabies is one of humanity's oldest documented diseases. Like, for those of you who took world history in high school, the first chapter in your textbook probably started with the Mesopotamians and the Code of Hammurabi. Rabies was documented before that. The idea that dog bites could cause death was documented over 4,000 years ago in the laws of Veshnina. By about 400 years later, healers recognized that rabies probably spread by something in the dog's saliva, kind of like how a snake bite has a special venom in it. But the most detailed ancient account comes from ancient India's Susruta Samhita, which dedicates about a thousand words to rabies and accurately describes its symptoms, including hydrophobia. The Susruta Samhita comments, If the patient in such a case becomes exceedingly frightened at the sight or mention of the very name of water, he should be understood to have been afflicted with water scare, and be deemed to have been doomed. This is why historians are confident that ancient scholars were documenting rabies. The combination of dog bite plus hydrophobia is pretty unique uniquely a rabies thing. Even the long incubation period has been documented for thousands of years. But that doesn't mean we've been making progress since then. The big Greek thinkers didn't give us much. Hippocrates doesn't actually mention rabies, and Aristotle got it pretty polar opposite wrong. Like, he recognized that rabies existed in animals, but he thought that humans were immune to it. But of all the Greeks, it was the poet Homer who contributed the most to rabies. He used the term lyssa when describing a warrior in the passion of battle, which is where we get the modern name for the family of viruses that cause rabies, lyssa virus. Lyssa can translate directly to rage or fury, or of course, 
rabies. And staying in ancient Greece, the legendary three-headed dog Cerberus was described as drooling like a rabid dog, and myth had it that his saliva dropped on the ground and gave rise to a plant called aconite, also known as wolfsbane, or monk's hood. Now, for as long as physicians have known about rabies, they've been looking for treatments for just as long, but with no success. Ancient Rome's Pliny the Elder recommended taking the dog that bit you, clipping off some of its tail, and taking that as a remedy. This is where the phrase hair of the dog comes from. It's a reference to the hair of the dog that bit you. Pliny also recommended cutting out a ligament from within the dog's mouth when they were a puppy, or you could use a mixture of dung of a badger, cuckoo, and swallow. Obviously, none of this worked. Fast forward a few hundred years, and the Islamic scholar Ibn al-Razi documented rabies as well, telling this story. There was with us in hospital one such man who barked during the night and then died. Another did not drink water, but when some water was brought to him, he was not afraid of it, but said, it stinks, and the stomachs of dogs and cats are in it. Yet another patient, when he saw water, shuddered, shivered, and trembled until it was taken away from him. Doctors kept documenting rabies through medieval times without making progress on treatments. But this is when we get the English word rabid and the French term la rage. At this point, the word for fury or madness becomes synonymous with rabies. And that's one thing I found interesting in my reading, is just how much of a cultural impact rabies had at the time. According to this September 1998 article in Neurology, the lore that inspired modern vampire stories probably came from observations of rabies. Then the 15 and 1600s saw a full-blown epidemic of werewolf reports, probably inspired by rabies victims too. Side note, I gotta recommend this book. Rabid, A Cultural History of the World's Most Diabolical Virus by Bill Wasik and Monica Murphy. It had great descriptions of how rabies made an impact on human cultures. I got a link to it down in the doobly-doo. Fast forward to 1702. Famous physician Richard Mead published a more modern case report on rabies. He recommended treating dog bites by first using bloodletting, then using a powder of black pepper and ground liverwort drunk in half a pint of cow's milk. This would be followed by a month of cold baths every morning, and I don't need to tell you, this was nothing. But someone would need to do something soon. By the way, for those of you who are sensitive about the treatment of animals, skip ahead like 45 seconds. By the late 18th, early 19th century, it became more popular for wealthy people to have dogs, especially in cities, and this created a ton of overhyped anxiety about rabies. Overhyped in the fact that diseases like tuberculosis and cholera claimed way more lives than rabies. The result was the culling of thousands of dogs throughout Europe thanks to rabies anxiety. Paris alone killed almost 10,000 dogs in 1879. Making things worse was the fact that by the early 1800s, we didn't really know much more about rabies than what Sosruta had written about millennia earlier. In 1805, Benjamin Rush wrote an account of rabies and took some shots in the dark about what caused it. He thought rabies was a type of fever, which would have been understood as its own disease anyway based on the humoral theory. And one of Rush's students, James Meese, thought rabies might pop up spontaneously in dogs. He also drew parallels to tetanus, another disease that spread through the nervous system and associated with puncture wounds. By the mid-1800s, some doctors and veterinarians believed that dogs could just become rabid, maybe from hunger or dehydration or, interestingly, sexual frustration. They thought that switching from a free-roaming wildlife to a domestic life so quickly was unnatural for doggy sex lives. So, in 1845, an Italian man that just went by Monsignor Storti wrote to the Medical Gazette of Milan to recommend seraglios for dogs. Basically, brothels for dogs. As far as I could tell, this never became a thing, but it's a... Uh... It's a visual, but rabies anxiety wasn't just a European thing. Over in the US, frontiersmen found out that skunks and wolves could transmit rabies too, and tried using indigenous treatments to fight them. Like the Blackfoot tribe suggested sweating out the illness, but more practically, they suggested just getting ready for death. So by the mid-1800s, rabies was a full-blown health panic. Anyone who cured rabies would become a worldwide celebrity. And this is how we got the world's first scientific vaccine. By the year 1870, there was only one human vaccine to speak of, the smallpox vaccine made popular by Edward Jenner in 1796. This is the one where he gave cowpox pus to healthy people and they developed immunity to smallpox. Obviously, it was a big deal in the history of medicine, but Jenner had no idea how the immune system worked, and even by the 1870s, nobody had made a ton of progress towards its understanding. That's where Louis Pasteur comes in. Pasteur thought it might be possible to find vaccines for every infectious disease. He'd been studying a bunch of different microbes and thought that an understanding of each of them would help systematize vaccine creation. I gave you Pasteur's biography in the germ theory video, so I don't want to repeat it here, but I do want to spend time understanding why he thought it would even be possible to vaccinate against rabies in the first place. At this point, Pasteur was a well-known scientist who'd already helped figure out the process of fermentation, stopped an epidemic among France's silkworm population, disproved 
proved the ancient idea of spontaneous generation, and of course, invented pasteurization. All of this was influencing the broader concept of germ theory, the idea that microorganisms cause infectious disease. Cool, so you want to make some vaccines. Where do you start? Well, the Pasteur lab decided to focus on cholera and chickens, which was ripping through France in the 1870s. The main biography of Pasteur tells a story like this. In 1877, the Pasteur lab started studying the germ that causes chicken cholera, what another scientist called Pasteurella multicida. Then one day during the particularly hot summer of 1879, a lab assistant named Emile Duclos was supposed to inject a sample of P. multicida into chickens, but forgot. He ended up leaving the bacteria out, then went on vacation for a few days. When he came back and injected those bacteria into chickens, they got some mild symptoms, but otherwise recovered. So they took those chickens, got a batch of new chickens who hadn't been exposed to this weakened bacteria, and injected both sets with a new, full-strength strain of cholera germ. They found that the chickens who had previously gotten the old, abandoned bacteria didn't contract the disease from the fresh batch of microbes, while the new flock did. It turned out that the old batch of cholera bacteria had been weakened to the point where it didn't produce infection, but the chicken's immune system had learned to recognize it, training it to fight the bacteria if it encountered it in the wild ever again. Pasteur called this process attenuation, and repeated the experiment a bunch of times to conclude that the summer heat and air exposure had attenuated the bacteria. And this was an encouraging first step towards his goal of systematizing vaccines. Unfortunately, it wouldn't be that easy for his next target. Anthrax. In 1876, Pasteur's main rival, Robert Koch, came out with an important research paper about the etiology of anthrax in livestock. So Pasteur and his assistants, fresh off the chicken cholera vaccine, began working on an attenuated vaccine against anthrax too. Unfortunately, just exposing it to air in a hot box lab didn't do anything, so they decided to heat it up to a specific temperature and attenuate the germ that way. His initial trials worked well, so he decided to hold a public demonstration on sheep, goats, and cows in May of 1881. He and his his assistant, Emile Roux, vaccinated half of the subjects with a heat-attenuated version of Bacillus anthracis, then gave all of them live anthrax. The vaccinated ones all lived, while the naive group all died. In a paper to the International Medical Congress in August of that year, he called this process vaccination, as homage to Jenner's smallpox treatment. Vaccine coming from vaca the Latin for cow. The main takeaway from the rest of the paper is that you might need different techniques to attenuate different germs and make successful vaccines. Which brings us back to rabies. Pasteur had only tackled animal diseases at this point. The human anthrax vaccine wouldn't be developed until the 1950s and wouldn't be approved until the 70s. He didn't want to tackle tuberculosis or human cholera since Koch had already made so much progress with them. But rabies might work. While it wasn't super widespread at the time, it was easy to recognize and had a clear route of transmission. And it was the perfect choice for the spectacle. It would be a dramatic, emotionally charged demonstration of the power of vaccination. Plus, there had been some big progress on it recently that Pasteur could piggyback on. In 1879, Pierre Gaultier demonstrated how dogs could transmit rabies to rabbits. Those rabbits could develop the disease more quickly, which made them good experimental animals. Plus, scientists were getting confident that the germ that causes rabies was something in the rabid animal's saliva. This had been assumed since antiquity, but couldn't really be shown until germ theory got going. So in 1880, Pasteur bought some rabid dogs and started trying to find the germ so that he could attenuate it and make a vaccine. Unfortunately, that was hard to do since rabies is caused by a virus, which is way, way smaller than bacteria. And Pasteur actually referred to the rabies germ as a virus, but the word had a different definition than it does today. They didn't know viruses were little packages of genetic material and proteins, but they did know that there were things smaller than bacteria that could cause disease. So they kept going even though they couldn't see the germ. And their first challenge was figuring out a more reliable way of giving their subjects rabies that didn't involve a dog bite. See, bites didn't always produce rabies, and there was a pretty good chance that the wound would get infected and lead to sepsis anyway. Plus, it can take a long time for symptoms to show up as the virus makes its way up the nervous system to the brain. So one of those assistants, Emile Roux, reasoned that he could bypass the virus's slow progression up the peripheral nervous system by chloroforming the rabbits, drilling a hole through their skulls, and injecting the rabies germ directly into their brain's dura matter. He repeated the process until he was sure he'd isolated the virus. They ended up creating a strain of the virus that produced the disease every time and shortened the incubation period from weeks to just eight days, which means they finally had a germ to experiment with. Now they could work on attenuation. One of those other scientists who'd worked on rabies, Victor Gaultier, made progress there too. 
In 1881, he injected some sheep with the saliva from a rabid dog, and he found that it protected the sheep from rabies injections going forward. This wasn't a proper vaccine, but he showed that it was possible to build immunity to the rabies virus. Knowing that there was such a long incubation period, Pasteur's initial goal was to create a post-exposure vaccine. So someone would get a dog bite and then get their rabies vaccine right afterwards. The idea was that this attenuated germ vaccine would be processed by the body before the natural infection got to the brain, thus conferring immunity against the germ. It was weaker, but faster. But Rue and the other assistants were never able to get a pure sample of the germ. They were still working with rabbit brains. So they decided to try to attenuate the virus by drying the rabbit's brains and spinal cords over a solution of potassium hydroxide. And they noticed that the longer that they left out the sample, the less virulent the virus, maxing out around 14 days of drying. After a while, they finally created a strain of the virus fast enough to beat a natural infection, but attenuated enough that a test animal could use it to build immunity. This was their vaccine candidate. But all of this was in dogs and rabbits still. Obviously, they were more worried about human trials. In 1885, Pasteur wrote a letter where he said that he'd be willing to try the rabies vaccine on himself, but like, not quite yet. Regardless, word got out about the rabies vaccine, and plenty of dog bite victims volunteered to be test subjects. They were looking at a 100% fatality rate otherwise, so even if there was a tiny chance the rabies vaccine would work, it was worth it. Now, Pasteur knew that his reputation depended on a successful first public attempt, so he had to be cautious here. And while he didn't publicize the results at the time, Pasteur's private notebook showed that he tried the vaccine on two human patients, both of which were referred to Pasteur as a last resort. One of them died, and the other survived, but might not have actually been exposed to rabies. But then came along Joseph Meister, a nine-year-old boy who was attacked by a potentially rabid dog. His local physician patched him up and cleaned the wounds, but sent him to Pasteur in Paris in desperation. Pasteur wasn't allowed to administer shots since he wasn't a medical doctor, so he teamed up with a physician and rabies expert named Alfred Volpin and a pediatrician named Jacques-Joseph Granchet to give the boy his rabies shots. Starting on July 6th, the team injected Meister with a rabbit spinal cord vaccine, and over the course of 10 days, they exposed him to 13 strains of virus that were less attenuated than the one before, meaning the final shot was the most powerful one. Now, usually, Pasteur was stoked on media, but he stayed relatively quiet during these 10 days in case the whole thing was a failure. Luckily, it wasn't. Meister got his last shot on July 16th and never developed rabies symptoms. Now, there was definitely a chance that the dog that bit Meister didn't have rabies, but after this many exposures to some potent rabies virus, it was clear their vaccine prevented the disease, whether the kid got it from a dog or from their lab. By October of 1885, Meister had stayed symptom-free for over 100 days, so Pasteur wrote a report and presented his story to the Academy of Sciences. But then the real challenge began. How do you go from one successful vaccination to protecting the entire planet against La Rage? News about the successful vaccination spread through France, and people started lining up to get rabies shots, some because they'd been bit, and some because rabies anxiety was still strong. But folks in the United States weren't really interested yet. Europe had a way more advanced medical science scene at the time, and only a few young American physicians kept up with European science. But that would start to change thanks to a high-profile case in America, just a few months after Meister. On December 2nd, 1885, four little boys from Newark, New Jersey were bit by a rabid dog. The next day, an American doctor got in touch with Pasteur and asked if he could send them to Paris for the vaccine. And before long, their town was pooling together money to send them on a ship overseas. Andrew Carnegie even donated to the cause. Within a few weeks, the boys were on a steamship to France, supervised by one of their mothers who was eight months pregnant. The boys made it to France by December 21st, they got their series of shots, and survived. And all this time, American newspapers were hooked on the story. They started reporting on rabies, supposed cures, and eventually about Pasteur's background in germ theory. And this was a big deal because it showed Americans that this new form of medicine was worth paying attention to. It's not far-fetched to say that these boys brought germ theory to North America. The Newark boys left Paris on January 3rd, 1886. And a few days later, the original Meister story was published in English in Popular Science Monthly, which is when the global demand for the rabies vaccine skyrocketed. Pasteur realized he'd need more space to expand vaccine production, so he did a bunch of fundraising and opened the Institut Pasteur in 1888. And the Institut became a massive deal in the history of medicine. Like, chances are, if I've said that a French guy helped develop an important medicine in the late 19th, early 20th century, they were probably involved at the Institute. Like diphtheria antitoxin, tuberculosis vaccine, discovery of the plague bacillus, typhus transmission, and the basis of the innate immune system were all studied at the PI. But of course, 
The rabies story doesn't end here. By 1903, a scientist at the Institute found that the causative agent of rabies could be passed through a filter, which meant it was probably a virus. Then over the years, as virology developed as a science and electron microscopy became a thing, we got a much better idea of what the virus looked like and how it worked. The vaccine itself has changed too. In 1915, they started attenuating the virus with phenol instead of air, and eventually stopped using rabbit nervous tissue in the 1950s. And of course, scientists are still working on more effective rabies vaccines today. But I'm more interested in the public health response. Like, it was clear that controlling rabies in humans meant controlling rabies in dogs, whether that was through vaccines or the Italian doggy brothels from 1845. And the best starting point was going to be domestic animals. It would be way easier to vaccinate everyone's pets compared to wild animals. But this is where the story starts spreading out on a country-by-country -country basis. Like, the UK had a big rabies problem by the end of the 19th century. There were 672 human deaths from rabies in the country in 1895. Now, prior to the vaccine, Parliament had already tried to control the problem by requiring dogs to be muzzled in public. And once the vaccine came out, they wanted to use it as part of the strategy too. But first they need infrastructure for distributing it. So they took inspiration from the Pasteur Institute and started the British Institute of Preventative Medicine in 1891, which was renamed to the Lister Institute. I got a video all about Joseph Lister, its namesake, if you want to check it out. The UK declared itself rabies-free in 1903, and only had a few cases ever since then, mostly between the world wars. And a few countries followed their model to get us where we are today. Like, the United States had six facilities that produced rabies vaccine by the year 1900. And over time, different U.S. states led vaccination campaigns for dogs, so that by the 40s and 50s, rabies was pretty much under control in the states. Then in the late 1970s, the U.S. and parts of Europe started programs where they put oral rabies vaccines in bait packages to help control rabies in wild animals. And they're not trying to eradicate all the rabies, just keep human population centers safe. But of course, it's a different story in poorer countries. In 2019, India had over 5,200 deaths from rabies. That same year, Nigeria, Pakistan, and Ethiopia all had close to 1,000 deaths from rabies as well. Just like other infectious diseases, we see the pattern of low-income countries get higher disease incidence. So the follow-up question is, can we ever get rid of rabies? Probably not. Island nations like the UK and Japan have kept themselves clear from rabies for big stretches of time, but it still hasn't been that long. Like, Bali declared itself rabies-free and saw an outbreak starting in 2008. And while we'll never vaccinate all the wild bats and skunks, they're not our biggest worries anyway. Dogs make up 90% of human exposures to rabies and 99% of human rabies deaths. And by far, the biggest factor in preventing a human infection is how successfully a nation vaccinates its dogs. Unfortunately, that isn't likely for the poorer countries where rabies is most common. Diseases like malaria and tuberculosis kill way more people than rabies. Plus, the prohibitively high cost of vaccinating dogs means that rabies isn't the number one priority. And aside from public health challenges, the biggest remaining hurdle is treatment once somebody has already been infected. The cool thing is that there have been people who have survived rabies once symptoms showed up. The first happened to a little boy in Ohio in 1972, then a woman in Argentina in 76, and most recently, a boy in India in 2020. I actually found a website that compiles all the rabies survivor case studies in one place. I'll put a link down in the description. While we're on the subject of infectious diseases, I got a whole playlist of stories that you can check out right here. I'm particularly proud of this video about the attempt to vaccinate against the great influenza pandemic of 1918. And a big thank you to my supporters on Patreon. Y'all are the best. Thanks for watching.